Welcome back to the Knights of Christendom, standing for Western Civilization, Holy Mother Church, and our King, Jesus Christ, in the face of a godless liberty. Tonight, we got a breaking story out of Rome as that synod, that Amazon synod that has brought horrors to the hearts of many Catholics across the globe. We've had a situation there where apparently those fertility goddesses, those mother earth goddesses that have sort of profaned many of the greatest churches in the history of Christendom, somebody went in there, gentlemen, or removed them and threw them in the Tiber River. I mean, this is coming from the Santa Maria in Transpotina Church near St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Listen, this thing has just swept the blogosphere, or should I say the Catholic's blogosphere. People are just cheering on this, I guess, <laughs> this act of courage by a Catholic that has had enough. Anthony, I'm telling you right now, I've been waiting for somebody, some of our ca great Catholic men who have always stood up in the age of Christendom for 2,000 years to defend Holy Mother Church. And here comes this hero out of nowhere. I don't, I didn't see his face on the video. I don't know who this guy is, but I'm going to tell you right now, this is a brother in arms. This is a knight in shining armor. This is one of our knights here within the realm of Christendom, my friend. What are your thoughts on this story? Absolutely, Frank. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Pure grace, brother. I mean, look, you can call it stolen. You can call it removed. You can call it what you want to call it. I call it the laity participating just like the spirit of Vatican II has asked us to do. We're simply participating, Frank. And we're participating in a big way because what we're doing is through our many rosaries and our prayers... We are letting the corrupt prelates, we don't know all of them, we know some of them, we're letting them know that this is our church, that we are the body of Christ. That's who we are. And as such, we are not going to allow paganism inside of our church. Absolutely. And Neil, listen, um, this thing has swept the internet, but I want to get started with some basic fundamentals here with you because I want to touch not only Catholics because I think the Catholic world knows about this, but I want to touch those who are outside the church who don't understand sort of the Catholic uh, sort of affinity towards art and symbols of religion in that sense. Listen, I've heard from non-Catholics, uh, Neil, from outside the church, you Catholics with your symbolic artwork here, which is all irrelevant. God is much bigger than the little gestures of symbols that you have placed human value on. Neil, what is the importance of art? And, and, and ultimately, related to us, what this means for this Catholic knight to run into this church and take these idolatrous images and throw them, fling them into the, the Tiber River to be gone forever, my friend. Well, the first thing I say to people like that is, if it's not a big deal and it's not an issue, then why are they upset that they threw it in the water to begin with? So, automatically implied in that questioning is a realization that art and sacred art, which I'll mention a, minute, a little bit more later, does indeed have a value that goes beyond simply what we can express through words. And to say otherwise denies all of human experience, all of human experience of any kind of artistic expression. I mean, even cavemen you know, had drawings on the cave walls. So art seems to go back to the very beginning of mankind and influence all of mankind. You know, there's the question that goes, does art imitate life and does life imitate art? Well, it goes both ways, actually. So the importance of art cannot be uh, watered down or misunderstood because even on a worldly level, not even talking about the, the spiritual, but on a worldly level, the psychology of art affects the human mind. Pieces of art have varying effects on the human person. It, it, a lot of times it bypasses the filter that we have on our, our mind, that we filter everything through. And it goes straight to the deeper parts of the human person. It affects the heart, the emotions, the, the deeper parts of the mind even. And it, uh, 
it raises us up into higher thinking. It activates a higher mode of thinking in the human mind. And none of this is shocking to anyone, really. Because when you look at something that's artistic, whatever it is that you consider artistic, you have a certain visceral reaction to it, whether it be where your mind goes with it or what happens emotionally to you. It affects you on a very profound level. To deny that is just to deny reality. And if that wasn't true, then we wouldn't have anything like advertisements. Because in those advertisements, they use images, visual images, sound images, to get to the person through their senses. And art does that on a very fundamental level. It affects us on a deep level. It, it, it engages our senses and influences us in different ways. And one of the things when I recently wrote a little article post on our site was uh, I used a quote from St. Gregory, who talked about how sacred art has often been used as a means of education. It's the, the books of the ignorant, is the way he put it. And we see this in medieval art. They're the stained glass windows. They depict the crucifixion, the visitation, uh, different parts of the scriptures, different parts of the, the way of the cross, uh, the saints, all these things are depicted artistically because at that time people can't read. They can't um, re not only read, but there's, there's, there's no such thing as schools at that time either. You're not going to school to learn things like that. So what do you do? You have these images that immediately educates the person visually. And one last real quick point, because I know I'm going on and on here. There's an example I use with my daughter and my son. My, when my son sees a cross, he starts going, Bobo, Gigi, Bobo. He automatically sees the wounds of Christ on the cross. And to my daughter, when she sees the cross at the church, she says, there's Jesus, there's Mary. She automatically understands Jesus is there. And that image participates in the reality of Christ and Mary and automatically teaches her on a fundamental level. And these idols do the same thing, but not holy, but evilly. And that says nothing about uh, demons and the spiritual, uh, the spiritual aspects, you know, and not worshiping false idols that God commands us to do. And the effects that the demonic can have through these pagan uh, pieces of art. Wow. Wow. Beautifully said, Neil. I mean, uh, just, you know, with me, I know that it, it lifts my soul when I go, for example, into a church that is a lot more devout. I guess you could say that the church that's been stripped down in the post-Vatican II church. And I think there you highlighted beautifully the significance of art and what it plays in the role of not only the world, but also within the realm of the faith. And I think this is why so many Catholics were outraged at these events that have been taking place ever since the sin had started. Anthony, I got up this morning and this thing was just a whirlwind through the internet. I know you found the story first and you started posting it on our site at the uh, Knights of Christian blog.blogspot.com and this thing has been a roller coaster ride for us here at Knights of Christian because your kind of um, sort of head first approach to report on this and detail this has garnered lots of attention for us. I guess, you know, in retrospect now, um, what were you thinking this morning? And um, the Vatican's reaction to this has been one of, I guess, horror and condemnation. Do you think they got any credibility at this point to with their condemnations? Are they going to sort of turn us uh, traditionalists or at least the faithful Catholics away with this condemnation? Uh, sure. I'd like to go back to uh, the question about art uh, as soon as, uh, but I'll, I'll answer this question first. Um, you know, of course the Vatican was going to come out and, and condemn this. Um, uh, you know, it, it's <laughs> we're in such a, a touchy-feely time right now. It's interesting, Frank, because liberal, liberal Catholics necessarily see, because I don't believe that liberals and conservatives should exist in the church. We should simply be Catholic, but we're living in incredibly strange times right now. But it seems to me that there's a double standard. Liberals can shut down traffic, freeways, they can stand out in the middle of anywhere and shut things down. You'll see the police tolerate this type of behavior. They can set up camp in front of about any public building they want to and carry on for almost as long as they want to. 
But as soon as one of us conservative boxy people, who typically we sit back, we're quiet, we're patient, we pray, as soon as they cross the line with us, they realize, they should realize if they don't, that we've had enough. That we're not going to sit back and take it anymore. And that what we saw in the Vatican Gardens was clearly pagan. Clearly some type of pagan worship. There's no question about it. And this idol was involved in it. And to get around to the art then, that object has, that has been used in a pagan ceremony then, as Neil points out, could have some type of demonic attachments. And it was the right thing to do to get out of the church. It would be the right thing to do to have that church exercised at this point, and the Vatican Gardens as well. This is not a joke. We're not going to sit here and watch our church be run over by a bunch of people that think we're just going to sit back and let it happen because we're typically very reserved and nice. Now they would portray us in a certain, in a different way. Some people, not all of them, but generally, this is what happens. Now, with the art, Frank, the art. This is a whole. It's a whole different situation because number one, how does Mary depict herself? We've already covered. I've already covered that it's been used in a pagan ceremony. But how does Mary depict herself? Very well said, Anthony. Uh, Neil, I, I think th the big question here is, is that we have two heroes here, it looks like, on this video that have stepped up really for the entire Catholic world now at this point in time to make this act of sacrifice. I don't know who these men are. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm sure the authorities are going to be involved because we're dealing with some very vindictive people in the Vatican at this point in time. Um, I'm also hearing rumors, Neil, that there is another church, uh, the Church of Santa Barbara in Rome, where somebody went in there, in there and took out some more pagan uh, sort of icons out of that church. I, we have not confirmed that yet. I'm waiting on confirmation. Neil, do you think this is the time Catholic men stand up and for Holy Mother Church, for our mother? Uh, do we finally say, you know, enough is enough? And are we going to start to see more Catholics really take charge now because we have a, a clergy that appears to be completely lost? Well, if I could, I'd make these guys honorary Knights of Christendom. I mean, I love them. Uh, their actions are completely justified and I think show heroic virtue. But that's my opinion. Um, what was that last thing you asked me? Well, do you think this is basically going to become a, a pattern now of yeah. lay people stepping up at this point to take their back their churches and their faith? Yeah, I would like to see this become a worldwide movement of where, I mean, because they don't have idols everywhere, but I mean, where, like I've talked to y'all kind of mentioning an idea where they just take it like the image of these idols and like destroy them as showing solidarity. With, with wanting to retake the faithfulness of the church, the traditions of the church, the true church, not this farce that we've been seeing coming out of the Amazon Synod and many things that have happened in the past, but the Synod is really a culmination of all the bad things you've been seeing. So I would love it if we see a lot more of this because this is probably one of the best ways of protest on top of that too, because it's, it's not breaking away from the church. They're not causing a schism. They're not, quote unquote, uh, reforming the church, you know, you know, like the Protestants or anything. They are doing something that they are very justified in doing, as St. Patrick has done um, and other saints have done, as Jesus did when he went to the temple and flipped tables. I mean, that's that was a violent uh, expression that Jesus did. So I think it's very justified and... To see more of it would be a good thing, and it, it would be a way of retaking, uh, I hate to say retaking the church as if somehow we lost it, you know, or, but a way of showing the corrupt that we're not just going to stand by and just pretend like nothing's happening. And it's important that these pagan things are not allowed to be in the sacred spaces. Because 
we in the, uh, this kind of goes back to when we talk about the traditional mass and since Vatican II and this kind of thing about how we've lost the sense of the sacred. We've rebelled against that. And we've once again bought into this idea, well, hell, anything goes. Everything's okay. It doesn't matter. It's all right. As long as you don't force your beliefs on me kind of thing. No, it's not all right. There is truth and there's error. There's pagan and there's Catholic. There is God and then there's Satan. And those, the things you've been seeing at the Amazon Synod and with these idols, is satanic. And these heroic men didn't stand by and talked about it. They went and did something about it. And God bless them for it. Yeah, and what's remarkable to me is, like I, I mentioned to you earlier, we're getting reports that more of these things are happening. And one of the churches that I'm hearing is the, the Church of Santa Barbara in uh, somewhere along uh, there in Rome or in Italy somewhere. And what's amazing is, if you remember the story of Santa Barbara, she died because she refused to bow to pagan idols at that time. She was a martyr for that cause. And there's been many Catholics over the years. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, as we often say, because so many martyrs died for the faith because they would not bow to false pagan gods. In fact, I remember a story a few years back, Neil, where um, you had a situation where one of the Fox News reporters was kidnapped by some Muslims in some uh, Middle Eastern country out there. About This is about a decade ago. And what the uh, Muslims wanted from the Fox News reporter was simply to renounce sort of their uh, religious faith and, you know, sort of to have this conversion to Islam, sort of this verbal conversion. And, of course, his thing was, well, if that's all they want, of course, I, I'm, I'm trying to save my life here. I don't want my head cut up. So, yeah, I, I, I kind of, you know, you know, accepted, you know, this kind of phony uh, acceptance of Muslim conversion on the spot there. But see, that's the whole point, because there's many Christians throughout history that had that same choice and did not cave, did not deny Christ, did not deny the Holy Family, did not deny the crucifix of our Lord. And in that sense, those are the martyrs that have died for, you know, rejecting these false idols. And now to have a church that seems to have been infiltrated by outsiders, Neil, that now is willing not only not to fight it, not only not to, um, you know, bend the knee in the face of a wicked pagan civilization in postmodern culture, but even more so, they seem to be celebrating and bringing it into the church. I mean, Neil, if there, if this isn't a sign of the diabolical that's entered into the church, and like we've heard from the likes of Malachi Martin, of some satanic seance that happened at some point, and I can't confirm that, Neil, but boy, it sure looks like a lot of the prophecies of a church that has been infiltrated with dark spirits we're, we seem to be living through that, Neil. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up Malachi Martin. When I first read stuff by him and listened to him, I thought it was interesting. It made sense. But I always had this caution of, well, Neil, you don't really know. You don't know. So he might be kind of crazy. I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> um, I believe him exactly what he said when he talked about the demonic infestation of the church and when he talked about satanic masses in the church and masons, I don't have proof, you know, like I said still. But from what I have seen coming out of the church today, and I'm in, the, in this modern times, I am thoroughly convinced of the accuracy of what he said. Because that's the only thing to me that makes sense. Because this is completely demonic. This is Masonic, this religious indifferentism, this, these weak need effeminate leaders. It, it disgusts me. I can't stand it, and I'm tired of it. And you know what? It's sad that laymen have to be men, the real men of the church, and go in there and, and protect the bride of Christ and protect our mother by getting rid of that stuff. <laughs> I caught myself. I know, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> um, when it's the bishop's job to do that, it's the bishop who's supposed to be protecting the church and the doctrines, and they w will not. Just like when Jesus said, how I longed to gather you as a chicken gathers her, her babies, 
but you would not. Well, these bishops will not stand up. Not all of them. There's some very good ones. I mean, and what has St. Paul say, you know, the stars shine the brightest in the darkness. Those bishops shine brightly. But the bad ones have such a loud voice and such power in the church. It's ridiculous. Beautifully said. Anthony, you back with us, buddy? Yes. Uh, I can finish up. I'll finish up that point on the art. So the second point on the art, Frank, is that Mary has given us an image of herself. We can ask the question, what would Mary give us? What image would she give us? And she's given us that image. Because Neil talks about how important an image is, how important art is, and the message it conveys, even to children. Mary has given us what? Our Lady of Guadalupe. A hieroglyphic symbol to, to a native population that was not Catholic. But that beautiful symbol that all Catholics embrace, including traditionalists, that beautiful symbol conveyed the message to the natives about the truth of the faith to such an extent that it took the priests in Mexico 10 years to finish baptizing everybody that wanted to be baptized. So Our Lady gave us a beautiful image of herself that conveys the message of the church and it, can, and it used the natives' uh, language and visual reference points to communicate to them. This image does none of that and it was used in a pagan ceremony, Frank. Yeah, yep, yeah, very well said. And um, with that, guys, let's go to our final thoughts. Uh, Neil, I want to start with you. Um, it's been one heck of a day with this story. I, I know I've been on the internet all day, and the traffic that's come to our site at the Knights of Christian, particularly our YouTube page, has been outstanding. But I want to go to you. Uh, again, what do you think is going to come of this story? What is the significance overall here? And um, give me your final thoughts, my friend. I dare say that I predict we're going to see more of this. I think we're going to see, um, I, how you want to say, revolt? I don't want to put it that way. Um, more people standing up in very public ways for the truths of the faith, the traditions of the faith. And... Really, this could be a really great moment uh, to get something going, to because this is this is something that builds momentum, and it may build enough momentum to really make a noise. Yeah, to say we're we're sick and tired of our church being abused. You know, this is our mother for God's sakes. This is the truth, and we're tired of it being treated like just an opinion among many. Uh, Something that can be tossed out and on, on a whim because we feel like it, because it, we give nice warm feelings, as opposed to standing for the truth like a man ought to do, and like these leaders ought to do. And this could be something that may indeed cause a movement to happen, where we might actually get real people, real faithful people, standing up for the faith. Very well said, my friend. And Anthony, uh, give us your final thoughts on this big story of the day. Yeah, Frank, my final thoughts go back to anti-Pope Felix II. Uh, he was installed by the emperor during the Arian heresy and kind of kicked out Pope Liberius. Uh, and the people, essentially, from what I understand, uh, helped to remove Pope Felix II, anti-Pope Felix II, and... Uh, Pope Liberius was reinstalled. Now, uh, anti-Pope Felix did die inside of the church. Um, there, There's different legends that surround what happened and uh, various understandings of that. But essentially, we need to pray for uh, an end to this division, Frank, and, because that's what we have here. Uh, there's a serious division in the church and they don't call the devil Diablo for nothing. It means division. And we need these divisions healed with the truth of the Catholic faith. We don't need to bend a knee to paganism. We're asking people that have some of the truth to look at the entirety of the truth. 
and Holy Mother Church. Very well said, my friend. And with that, I'd like to remind my fellow Catholics, brothers and sisters out there, that we're all called to be knights, knights of Christendom, to defend Holy Mother Church from the infiltrators of the pagan world that have looked to destroy our church and our Lord's church, I should rather say, for two thousand years we are at a pinnacle point in human history we know that through the revelations of the holy mother of god that has warned us that these turbulent times will come within the church and the world at large and it is time for us catholics even as the minority that we've become unbelievably throughout the world it is time for us to rise and to defend our lord to defend our holy mother church once and for all it is time for Catholic men to arise like Catholic men have always risen throughout the history of Christendom to the defense of Holy Mother Church, defense of the faith, but also to the defense of Western civilization and our families. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Anthony. I want to thank Neil for joining me tonight. This is Frank signing off for the Knights of Christendom. Good night, everybody. Good night.